Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the fourth in a series of webinars that we'll be providing on macro and MIPS. The focus of today will be on improvement activities. My name is Chris Conrad, and I'm the product manager here at Amazing Charts. Alongside me today are Chris Tremblay, Director of Product Strategy, and Kate Vanderweef, and they'd be assisting me with any questions that you may have. Speaking about questions, we're going to hold off on taking any questions until the end of the pro presentation, um, but feel free to submit them throughout the presentation by entering them in the little chat window uh, in the uh, webinar toolbar over to the right-hand side. All right, and then we'll be recording these throughout the day, aggregating them, and then address them at the end of the uh, presentation. So let's talk a little bit about the subjects that we'll be covering today. <clears throat> Just as we did in the other presentations in this series, we're going to start off with a brief overview of the basics on macro MIPS. We're going to cover the basics of the improvement activities, which will also include a brief tour of CMS's QPP website. And as I've mentioned previously, this site is really well done. And if you haven't seen it yet, I encourage you to spend a little bit of time acclimating yourself to the tools they offer. Um, the link to the site is included in this PowerPoint, which we emailed to all of you uh, earlier. Uh, the slides can also be found in the handout section of the GoToWebinar down near that chat window as well. There's a little button that says Slides, and if you open that up, you'll see this presentation as well as some others that we felt would be very helpful. All right. um, you do need the Adobe Reader to open them, and uh, if you don't have it handy right now, then just download it after the presentation, and you'll have access to that. Okay, um, we're also going to show you the differences between the three levels of participation, test, partial, and full, also referred to as PATHs. We're going to also demonstrate how you use amazing charts, in some cases, to track your progress on the improvement activities that you have selected. We'll also review how improvement activities contribute to your overall composite score. And then we'll briefly discuss submissions and then wrap up with questions at the end. Now, as I mentioned, please feel free to submit your questions during the presentation using that comment box. Um, we should have ample time for questions. Uh, we've scheduled this webinar for an hour, but it's probably 30 minutes tops. It's by far the easiest of the three performance categories to explain. As, as you see, uh, I don't think you're going to have any problem receiving your 15 points for this category with minimal effort. OK. OK. The next couple slides are going to be a recap of the program in general. Uh, the MACRA Act of 2015 created the Quality Payment Program, or QPP, as we'll refer to it. A section within the Act aimed at paying, paying clinicians for positive patient outcomes instead of volume of care. And under the program, physicians participating would be paid in one of two ways, via MIPS, and we do believe the vast majority of providers will be paid via MIPS, and then also via what they're going to call the alternate payment model. This webinar is going to be focused strictly on MIPS, which combines parts of PQRS, meaningful use, and the value-based payment modifier into one system. And this system is based on four categories, performance categories. The four categories are quality, like PQRS, advancing care information, similar to meaningful use, Improvement activities, this is new, and this is what we're discussing today, and resource use or cost. And this is not applicable at all in 2017 reporting, so we're not going to be addressing it uh, at this time. So each performance category is worth a certain number of points. And when the points are factored together, comprise what is referred to as your composite score. And that score will determine who will get an incentive payment or a penalty. Think of the composite score as your final grade. Okay, 
and as I mentioned, here, here's the categories. The, they're, they're, the four categories are weighted according to difficulty. Quality, 60% of the total score. Improvement activities, 15. And advancing care is worth 25%. And, and we're going to talk more about the, um, the scoring later in this presentation. So let's talk about timelines. This webinar series has been focused on the 2017 reporting period. It is the actionable period which will impact your score. The MIPS program began in January 1st, 2017 of this year. And the length of the reporting period is determined by the participation level or path that you decide to take. Now, considering the current political climate as well as CMS and ONC's lack of clarity on what should be done after 2017, the requirements for 2018 at this time are really undetermined. And CMS has even stated that they expect to provide more information later this year for what you'll need to do in 2018. So let's remain totally focused on what you're going to have to do now in 2017. What you do in 2017 and the path you take determines your reimbursement rate for 2019. Do nothing and you'll experience a 4% reduction in Medicare reimbursements in 2019. Now, since you're on this webinar, we can assume that you've decided to do something, at least given the knowledge that you have at this time. Now, you can stay on Amazing Charts 2014 certified version for all of 2017. We will be offering a new version of Amazing Charts, version 10, late this year, which will be ONC 2015 certified. All right, but you do not need that version in any part of 2017. So you're on 2014, you're fine. Currently, the ONC is requiring that you be on a 2015 version. I know these dates can get confusing, but that's what they call them. Um, it's requiring that you be on the 2015 version, our version 10, for 90 days in next year, in 2018, which would mean that you need to have the new version 10 of Amazing Charts by October 2018 of next year. So for now, you're fine. Okay, so here's a quick review of the past. Do nothing and take the 4%. All right. Take the test path where you do the absolute minimum and receive no penalty. Nor are you eligible for any additional payments. CMS has really made this test path simple. Their goal is really to just to incite providers to take some form of action. We recently posted a short tip sheet on our website uh, that discusses the options under the test path, test path, <laughs> in, um, which will provide a little bit more information for you, encapsulation of your different options. In reality, if you understand how easy the test path is, no one needs to be taking any deduction in 2019. In our estimation, most providers complete this with 30 minutes of effort. And after today's presentation, you may find that you can meet it by literally doing nothing but attesting to one of the improvement activities that you already do. So that's it for the test path. Then there's there's the partial participation, where you'll report on a small number of measures, and we talked about that in our first series, quality measures, and you'll need and a small number of measures, and you need to do those activities for a minimum of 90 days in 2017. And then we have full participation, all right? And full participation is where you do as much as you can for as long as you can. Uh, think of partial and full as being on a continuum. The more measures you do, and the better you do on those measures, then the better the chances are of an increased Medicare payment in 2019. There's no guarantees of payments. There, it improves your chances of an increased payment. 
Okay, so let's look at improvement activities. Improvement activities are activities designed to reward clinicians for care, focused on care coordination, beneficiary engagement, and patient safety. There are two levels. There's a medium level activity for which you receive 10 points. There are high level activities for which you receive 20. Now this would imply that the high levels are more difficult and probably take more effort on your behalf. And when you see the list, it's, it's, it's true. Um, the, the, the higher level ones definitely do take a little bit more effort. But as you'll also see, they're extremely flexible. CMS doesn't provide very specific details on accomplishing any one activity. Uh, and you'll see a little bit more uh, in a little bit on this. Another part about these activities is you attest to them. There are no numerator, denominator metrics that you need to report on as you do with the other categories. And then if you're an individual or in a small group, your requirements are less than those in a large group. And that's in the number of points that you need to obtain. So the activities, so the number of activities you have to do is going to be based on the level of participation you choose or your path. If you choose to do the test path, where you simply want to avoid the 4% penalty in 2019, then all you have to do is one activity, a medium or high, for a period of 90 days in 2017, then attest to doing that in March of 2018 next year that you did it and you're done. No penalty in 2019. Test pass. For the partial and full pass, it depends on your practice size. Small practices of 15 or fewer clinicians in a rural setting or HPSAs, you only need 20 points. Larger practices need 40 points. And as you look through all the available activities that you'll see, you really don't need an EHR at all to accomplish these. Um, some activities, if done using an electronic health record, which most of you already do if you're using Amazing Charts and on this presentation, you can earn additional points. All right. These put, you don't get points in the um, improvement activities, okay? It's you're going to do two, you're going to do four, you're going to get 20 points, you're going to get 40 points, and you're done there. But if there are some activities that um, you can get, I think it's five, five bonus points per as part of your advancing care category for using one of these. And they're designated on the... Um, uh, we have them highlighted in a future slide, and I'll show you a couple of them. But they're actually in Appendix F. I have that noted down in the bottom. Table H, table H because I can't see that right now. <laughs> in Table H, uh, they don't make it obvious, but they're on the QPP site if you're interested in trying to take advantage of that. Okay. So now we're going to launch over to the QPP site and actually take a look at some of this. It was just a second. Okay. So up at the top, you'll see there's an activity waiting box. And we'll be there in just a second. So this is what I discussed there. There are high and there are medium. There's no low. It's 10 or 20, and they call it high or medium. So let's take a look at high. You click the box, uncheck the medium if it's already checked, and this is displaying the activities of high weight that are worth 20 points. And we're just going to take a couple, uh, I'll look at a couple of these just briefly. Uh, consultation of prescription drug program. Uh, many states already mandate this. So if you're prescribing Schedule II drugs and consult the registry, you're eligible for the 20 points just for doing this activity. 
All right. And note how you know basic the description is. It's not a lot of detail. Let's take a look at another one. Engagement of new Medicaid patients and follow-up. All right. Seeing new and follow-up Medicaid patients in a timely manner, including individuals duly eligible for Medicaid and Medicare. So basically, do you see Medicaid patients? If you do, you get the 20 points for this one. Okay? Now, the, the, um, the requirements, as I noted earlier, are vague. What's timely? Well, they don't go into detail, and we may speculate that it's just they want you to make an effort. They're making these very easy to accomplish. Um, these, obviously, I picked two of the least complicated ones for my examples, all right? Um, and, and as far as the remaining high activities, they definitely get more complex. I, I'm not going to go through them in detail, but we really, if you haven't already, I encourage you, go to the site, read through them. Um, and uh, you'll get a gist for it rather quickly. Okay, so let's go up to the top now, and we're going to switch from the heavyweight to the medium. And we're just going to take a couple, a look at a couple more of these. All right. Uh, let's go down and pick the depression screening. Okay, uh, depression screening and follow-up plan regular engagement of clinicians and groups of integrated prevention. Um, you, you can read this, but many, are, many physicians are already doing depression screening. Now, the, the, the description is a little ambiguous. I'm going to leave it up to you uh, to determine if that uh, meets with the, um, the actions that you're currently taking. Um, but it's a pretty simple one that's already being done by a lot of practices. Uh, let's take a look at diabetes screening. Diabetes screening for pizza with schizophrenia and bipolar disease using antipsychotic. It's The point is, it isn't simply diabetes screening. It's specific under a certain criteria. So you have to be careful in what you, how you read these, um, but there's not much to read. But there's one more. Let's pick another one. Uh, improved practices that engage patients pre-visit down here in the pile. There we go. Okay. Provide a pre-visit development of a shared visit agenda with the patient. Pretty big. Um, it doesn't seem like if you're doing any pre-visit evaluations now that this would be able to be met rather easily. Um, the bottom line, and, and we won't go through them in detail, um, because there isn't a lot more than these to, get, to, to go through. There are 92 of these to choose from. All right? You only need two to get your 20 points. 40 if you're a large practice. There are no bonus points for doing anything more in this category. So you're only going to do two or four. So what we can advise is, Go to the QPP site, peruse through this list, and identify the two or four that you're already doing and plan to attest to those at the end of 2017 or next year. So we've added a slide here um, uh, that lists a few of the ones that we've discussed uh, with a little bit more detail on the actions you could take to satisfy them. Um, now, please consider these as our examples. And this is our best interpretation, given the vagueness of the criteria in some of the cases. Ultimately, it's going to be up to you to pick those that you feel most comfortable doing. But let's look at a couple of these in a little bit more detail now uh, as it relates to amazing charts. Um, so, as I did say, you don't need to use Amazing Charts for, or any uh, electronic uh, EHR, for that matter, uh, to complete any improvements. Uh, but some of them, you know, uh, Amazing Charts can be helpful, and we'll try to kind of guide you through a couple of those. 
Okay, let's look at this medium activity. Uh, most, most, most physicians refer or receive referrals. Um, as such, you send a referral note or receive a referral summary. Um, so establish standard operations to manage transitions of care. That could include one or more of the following. Okay, establish formal lines of communications with local settings. Um, you're just really ensuring your patient panels receive care to ensure documented flow of information. All right, now these are our down here underneath. These are the things you could do in amazing charts. We say could do. You could ensure the doctor uh, sends you a referral uh, clinical summary and plan of care after the visit by either fax, mail, or direct messaging. You don't need the EHR to do it via fax or mail. Uh, you can contact the patient after you receive the information and perhaps writing a secure message to the patient for it for the follow-up appointment, or you can import the documentation. These are just ways that you can use amazing charts to satisfy this particular one if you so choose. If you're already doing this, this may be one of the ones that you want to attest to if you don't have any others. So let's look at another. Improve practices. Um, the disseminate appropriate self-management materials. Patient education. All right. Uh, now this one is a bit special. And this is one I referred to a little bit earlier. There are a few of these improvement activities that when combined with an EHR make you eligible for five bonus points in the advancing care category. So if you're already doing this and clicking the button, you can meet this and you get five extra points in advancing care. Okay. Uh, let's take a look at another one. Uh, now here's one you need to read carefully. Most practices, I would hope, have some protocols in place for communicating lab results to the patients. You're not getting credit for that. Note how it states improvements that contribute to more timely communication of test results. All right, so to meet this, you need to demonstrate how you've improved upon an existing process in 2017. They don't say how. Um, one could speculate. <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that for this presentation, but that is the basis for meeting the requirement, making improvements in how you um, communicate lab results. Uh, and we made a couple suggestions in there. We have um, depression screening. Um, you could leverage from existing um, uh, depression screening follow-up regular MIPS. Um, you can leverage from the existing um, division support rules that already exist within Amazing Charts. Um, and you can just attest to doing the screening. But if you need to demonstrate it, you have to have a follow-up plan as well in place. That's noted in the, the room. So it's just not a matter of... Uh, of doing the screening itself, but most people do have a follow-up plan in mind if they don't need the appropriate guidelines. So uh, let's jump back to this summary for just a minute. As I mentioned, these are potential suggestions on how you could satisfy these with AC, with or without AC for that matter. Ultimately, it's up to you to pick and choose which ones you feel most comfortable with. Uh, there are 92 activities. You only need two to get your 20 points or 40. There are no bonus points. All right, so review the list on the QPP site. And the link is, we provided this, um, uh, the link is right here at the top of this page. And we've also provided it at the end in the resources if you haven't seen it already. Review the list on the QPP. Find the two or four that you're already doing and attest to these. So let's take a quick look at how this impacts scoring. Okay. Oh, here's the QPP site. Um, I, I put this in the last minute. So one of the things is the, the results are rather vague or the guidelines are rather vague. QPP is very good at responding to your questions. Um, you can call them, and, or they have an email. Um, we've received very good results, and we've asked quite a few questions. 
So if you, you have a couple of these and you're, it's questionable on whether, what you need to actually consider them to be met um, before you would test, reach out to them. Um, we're hoping that they're going to do one of two things. After they get marked with a lot of questions asking for more clarity around the guidelines, they enhance the criteria that they have to meet, or they're just going to leave it the way it is and say, you know, it's that easy. It's that easy, and they're not going to do it anymore. So they're there for you um, specifically. Amazing Charts is really not positioned to reply to how you need to meet these guidelines. As you can see, they have not provided us either with any discrete information on what you need to do to meet this. So we are just not positioned to do that like we are with measures. It's more discrete. It's objective. We have a formula we follow and we can code to, and therefore we can assist you with this. It's not going to be the case with these um, improvement activities. But luckily, you only need two or four. And it, as you can see by the list, it should be pretty close to attaining those. Okay, so now let's look at scoring a little bit. First, if you're taking the test bath just to avoid the reduction, this is pretty simple, all right? A testing to a single activity improvement may well be the path of least resistance to avoiding the penalty. Both quality measure and advanced care require more work on your behalf. But if you were to identify one single improvement activity that you already do on a continuous basis, or at least for 90 days, then you simply attest to that for 2017, you're done. Okay. So, with just to avoid the, take, the penalty off the table, let's assume that you want to maximize any potential for a bonus payment, which we found by surveying is the majority of the people on uh, these calls. Um, you can select the two or four activities based on the size of your practice. So you've now earned your 20 or 40 points in the improvement activities performance. You simply divide that number, by the number of your points, let's take 20, you divide it by the number of re points that are required based on the size of your practice, which is 20, and this is the ratio, all right? You want to be at 1, 20 over 20 or 40 over 40, you get a 1, and that gets you your 15 points towards your composite score. It made it a little bit complicated by having to divide it by the number of required points, and we mentioned here, you can earn 0, 10, 20, 30, but given how simple this is, there should be no reason you don't get 20 over 20 or 40 over 40. It would be very difficult to get just 1. So 1 over, you know, 10 over 20 would be half of your 15 points. You're only going to hit 7.5 points towards your final score. Okay? So let's quickly review composite scoring again because in the end that's all that really matters. The four categories are weighted. Quality, 60%. Improvement, 15 Advancing care is worth 25 In the examples we reviewed today, I think you see how easy it is to earn your 15 points in this particular category. Um, let's quickly review submission method, as we did in the previous webinars. Uh, CMS is developing a website, which will be available later this year. Uh, very similar to what you do now for meaningful use, which will enable you to attest for the improvement activities. You're also going to be uh, able to attest via Qualified Registry or QCDR. And some, but not all QCDRs, in addition to submitting your quality measures, will also offer the ability to attest to ACI and improvement activities as well. So one-stop shopping. For, for some of these um, QCDRs. Um, we've included a slide here with some resources. Um, it's, it's a really a list of everything out on our, our website. We have FAQs, the timelines. There's uh, recordings of all the previous. This is our fourth, so there's four recordings out there. Uh, there's some tip sheets. There's a plethora of information that we hope you find helpful. 
And we've also included a link to the QPP site here as well. Um, and then, as I noted, it's it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there, there, when we were doing the, the webinar, there wasn't a lot more, uh, very much more content that we felt we really had to decide to put it in context. So we're now in a, a position of moving on to uh, questions and answers for any of you. So if you haven't already, please feel free to submit in the chat box. Uh, we've been having a few coming in. Give us just a minute to uh, give us just a couple minutes to put the questions together, and we'll be back online. Okay, thank you. Thanks for hanging on. We're back with you now. Uh, I'm Chris Trembley, Director of Product Strategy here at Amazing Charts. We've collected your questions and um, have prepared some answers uh, during uh, the Chris's presentation, so we'll get started. Uh, one of you asked, um, the slides say that you can wait uh, until October 1st of 2018 to upgrade to the 2015 certified software. Where did we get that information? Well, the reason why we made that determination, and, and so first I'd encourage you, um, if you are taking the partial or the full uh, path forward for MIPS next year, that you uh, upgrade earlier in 2018, but the, the very last period for reporting your 2018 numbers uh, would start October 1st. So in the rule, you are required to be on a ONC 2015 certified version only for the ACI category. So you can still measure all of your quality. You can do your improvement activities. The only part of the rule that specifically says you have to be on updated certified software is the ACI, Advancing Care Information category. And because you need to do that for 90 days, we determined that you could wait as possibly as late as October 2018 to upgrade. Since we're going to have our version out in the fourth quarter of 2017, we'd absolutely encourage you to get on the new version, start taking advantage of the new quality measures and other things that will be in version 10. Um, but that would be the, the last period uh, in which you would need to upgrade. Uh, the next question, where can I find the list of improvement activities that I get bonus points for if I use an EHR? Well, that's interesting because as good as the QPP site is, they didn't explicitly identify which activities would qualify for bonus points in that list that we showed you. The medium and high um, categories don't explicitly say that. So where we found them is in the MIPS final rule, uh, in the very last dozen pages or so uh, called Table H, where it indicates that if you do these particular improvement activities, you'll get bonus points on your ACI category. So uh, we've got links to that uh, that you can find on our website and in the presentation so you can check out which ones apply. Where can I watch the past webinars that you did? Uh, so we've done three. This is the fourth in the series. Uh, the first one was MIPS 101, which gave a very deep, uh, broad overview of the whole program. We did another on advancing care and another on quality. And you can find those pre-recorded versions, um, again, on our website. The link uh, is in these materials. All right. We've got a few more questions. Can you recommend any easy to use registries? Um, yes, we can actually. Uh, we work with a number of registries on our uh, practice's behalf. And we have for many years now, particularly for specialists who regularly used registries to submit for PQRS. So we've deepened some of our relationships with registries. We recommend uh, that you register with Elixir, which will match you to the registry that best fits your needs. So if you're internal medicine, if you're 
an endocrinologist, if you're a family health doctor, there are uh, registry choices. The choices for you really are based on what types of things you would uh, typically successfully measure, uh, particularly for quality in your practice, and, and the registry can uh, help you hone in on uh, which ones you're doing well at, which ones uh, could be improved, and give you a continuous monitoring uh, strategy throughout the year. So check out uh, Elixir, E-L-I-X-I-R, uh, to get started with that. We will be in early next month, early May, first week of May, I believe, uh, we will be sending you more information about a webinar just about registries and what they can do for you and how to sign up. So that's coming in just a couple weeks. Uh, MIPS criteria, can it be submitted directly from Amazing Charts? Uh, no. For uh, the 2017 quality measures, you will need to use a QCDR, a Qualified Data Registry, to submit may not want to take advantage of all the other services that are offered uh, from a registry, but for reporting, uh, that would be the mechanism for 2017. Uh, we may have a different solution in place for uh, 2018 reporting. Uh, your advancing care information and improvement activities, um, you can go directly to the CMS website for attestation, uh, or you may be also able to use uh, the registry that you choose for your quality reporting. When will this webinar be available? Uh, we'll hope to have it up in the next couple of days, but uh, before the end of the week uh, for sure, so that you'll be able to send the link around uh, to your friends and colleagues at the practice and uh, watch this again at your leisure. Is there a minimum percentage for each measure like PHQ depression for a passing score. So for improvement activities in particular, there is no threshold. There, they are attestations. Yes, I did this activity. Um, for quality, that's a different story because you are going to be measured against your peers and the Scoring will be variable based on how well others do uh, for each of those quality measures. So quality is different, uh, it, but for improvement activities, you simply need to attest that you have done them for the required period. And are you saying that we should update to 9.0 or 9.3 to do MIPS? Um, in general, yes. We, we, we do want you to have the latest and greatest versions of all of our tools. It's not absolutely required that you upgrade. You could successfully uh, do everything you need to do in 2017 on your current version. Um, but if you want to track and report uh, 2017 advancing care information, uh, you would be most successful on uh, our current version 9.3 or above. And we're going to put you on hold for one more minute, and then we'll take the last batch of questions and wrap up. And so for our final question, a user asked if we will be providing a dashboard to track ACI and quality measures with version 10. And the answer to that is yes, along with many other features that should help your MIPS uh, journey be a little bit easier. There will be a cost associated with version 10. We're not ready yet to, to uh, announce the cost, but we will be uh, providing more information around mid-year so that you can plan uh, for a year end and, and 2018. Thank you all for attending. And please check out the recorded version at the end of this week that we'll publish on our website. Bye.